Welcome to Asia in Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp, President of Sharp uh, Research and Translation. Our show today, A View of Asia from the Potomac. We're very happy to have with us today Ambassador Richard L. Armitage. Uh, Ambassador Armitage served as U.S. Deputy Secretary of State from 2001 to 2005. Prior to that, from 1983 to 1989, he served as Assistant Secretary of Defense for International Security Affairs. Ambassador Armitage is currently the president of Armitage uh, International. He's a graduate of the United States Naval Academy, where he played football with Roger Stahlbeck. He also is a veteran of the Vietnam War. Uh, he is co-chairman of Pacific Forum, CSIS, and in fact is here in Honolulu and arrived just a couple of hours ago, so we're really fortunate to have him in our studio. But he's here mainly to be, be the keynote speaker at Pacific Forum CIS, uh, his 40th anniversary dinner tomorrow night. By the way, tickets are still available by calling 521-6745. Welcome to Asian Review. It's great to have you Thank you, you Mr. There. Sharp. Glad to, glad, so glad you could make it. Well, tell us a little bit about Armitage International. We are a bunch of out-of-work Republicans. Uh, we all served, <laughs> served together, both in the Pentagon and in the uh, State Department. And if a U.S. company has a problem overseas that is not a legal problem, uh, we'll be glad to try to solve that problem for them, if it's bureaucratic or corruption or something like that. Market access? Uh, sometimes market access, but generally it's, it's more procedural or bureaucratic or, or corruption related. Do you do like political risk analysis and that sort of thing? No, it's a cottage industry from people who, as I say, the out of work Republicans and others, so I, I let others do that. <laughs> we actually like to have a result. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, in the car on the way over, you said it's really the, the rebalance and not the pivot. Why do you prefer the, the term rebalance? Well, it was, uh, I think it's more faithful to what the administration wanted. They wanted to rebalance out of two uh, unpopular wars, both Iraq and Afghanistan, and also to rebalance within Asia, not to have a sole focus on Northeast Asia, but also to spend some much uh, warranted time uh, thinking about the things in Southeast Asia and indeed the South Pacific. So it's a much, uh, I think, more descriptive term. Hmm. Well, is the, is the rebalance successful? Mr. Sharp, I think it's mixed. Uh, we initially moved in the security field only, mm -hmm. and uh, because we could move assets quickly and expand radar uh, to Japan, uh, Marines to Darwin, Australia, uh, but we didn't move with our whole of government concept, and that is of trade and exchanges and education and cultural involvement. Uh, and it left the impression in certain minds, certainly the Chinese, that we were only interested in containment. Mm. So I think it took us a long time to get our act together so we could have a whole of government approach. And, uh, and now uh, the irony is that we're on the verge of, uh, I think, a successful rebalancing. Uh, but unless we get TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, mm -hmm. even if we rebalanced in an absolutely correct manner, we'll get a D-minus for the course if we don't get TPP. <laughs> if, on the other hand, we... Uh, continue to rebalance in a chaotic and uh, uh, way, uh, but got TPP. Uh, we'd probably get a B plus for the course. So that's how important this trade uh, agreement is. Well, I'm glad you brought that up. Actually, I was going to ask that a little bit later, but since we're there now, let's let's go for it. Um, what's going to happen with TPP? We need TPA first, right, to give the president fast track authority, and then if he can get that. TPP seems like it will come along pretty naturally, but it's... Well, it, I, I don't know. I think I, I give it about a 55 to 60 percent chance of a positive uh, solution to TPP. Uh, we had one break recently. Senator Ted Cruz, one of the darlings of the Tea Party, announced that he was for TPA. He was. He, he was. Okay. And uh, that's a, a, a break in the ranks of the Tea Party. And, and the strange bedfellows are involved in opposing this trade agreement. It's uh, the liberal left and the Tea Party right. Uh, and whether they have a big enough center of gravity to uh, oppose the president's will uh, and what I think is good for this country and certainly for others in uh, 12 total negotiating partners, then uh, we'll see. If we don't pass TPP, the rebalance is in jeopardy. American leadership is in jeopardy in Asia, isn't it? I think it is. Uh, nothing is ever final. 
Uh, and I, I wouldn't want to say that if we don't get TPP, then we're out of the game in Asia, but it's a serious setback. Uh, we've had setbacks from time to time in the past, uh, and we rebound over time. But this is uh, raising the, the uh, transparency and the level of commitment to higher standards of all the country, or to all of the countries in Asia. And that with this trade agreement is such an enormously beneficial move that it pains me mm. to think uh, that uh, American leadership might not be up to that task. Mm. I mean, so much time and energy is going into TPP already. Well, time and energy for the USTR and the negotiators, but it wasn't only until recently that our president actually got personally involved. I would have argued he should have been involved for quite a while, but he's in it now. And uh, thank heaven for small favors. Some people say that he's in it, he's in TPP just the way Clinton was into NAFTA. Is that a fair statement? Uh, no, I think actually Mr. Clinton, uh, who's so gregarious and likes people so much, actually had a bigger appreciation for the give and take in the political process. Mm. So I'd have to say that uh, Mr. Clinton probably enjoyed the engagement more. Mr. Obama looks to me like he enjoys it about as much as having his teeth pulled. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's interesting. Um, and of course, the U.S. has a, a, a pending um, trade agreement with Europe too, doesn't it? Yes, Which TTIP. 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 Okay. Um, if TPP goes down, is it there some chance that will go down too? Well, I, there's a chance, sure. But uh, let's see what happens if TPP goes down. It may have such a jarring blow to the to the system uh, that maybe members of Congress will rethink their position. As I say, nothing's ever over for good, mm. but it'll be a serious blow. Right. I remember getting the uh, U.S.-Korea uh, um, FTA passed, which is a long, drawn-out process, yes. but ultimately was successful. Yes. You know, personally, I was for that. I wrote some op-ed pieces in favor of that, and I, just as I'm in favor of TPP. Mm. Strategy. Um, is the rebalance really a strategy for Asia? I think the rebalance is a faithful reflection of our equities in the area. Mm. Uh, and uh, we've got huge equities in almost every sphere, whether it's uh, energy, uh, whether it's a uh, 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 size of militaries, populations, GDPs. Uh, all of which are huge in the area. So rebalancing and spending more attention to this area is appropriate. It does not necessarily mean that we turn our backs on Europe or the Middle East, and God knows right now because of the problem of ISIS, mm -hmm. or ISIL, take your pick, uh, <laughs> okay. that our naval assets are tied up primarily in the Persian Gulf and not available for further duty here in Asia. Mm. Mm. Um, we talked about this a little bit outside before we started the show. Uh, I, I tried to pin you down and see who you thought was the best strategic thinker in Washington. And you re really didn't have put your finger on anybody. But who were some of the leading strategic thinkers? Look, I, I think the, the, the previous bunch who were the strategic thinkers, the, the grand old men, uh, the Kissingers, the Brzezinski's, the Schultz's, they're moving off of the stage. And the young folks who work at CSIS or Center for New American Strategy, uh, Richard Fontaine, Randy Shriver, Cara Bue, a couple mm. of whom happen to be my partners, these are the people who are coming up to take the reins. Some of the guests you've had on your show, Mike Green, Victor Cha, these are all folks waiting in the wings to become the next strategic thinkers. But as I mentioned to you, I'm a little out of step, I guess, with a lot, maybe in academia, but certainly a lot of my colleagues in Washington. I, I think the word strategy and having a, a, a strategy for the present situation is, is not a, an appropriate use of the word. Mm. Strategies, uh, we have faced several different, completely different issues, mm. whether it's Ukraine and Russia, whether it's ISIL, whether it's Boko Haram, uh, whether it's uh, Afghanistan or, for that matter, China. There is no strategy which can adjust and fit to all of those. So I prefer to think about a philosophy of governance of the United States and what, how we view ourselves and how we view ourselves acting on the world stage. 
I hold the view that nothing really meaningful can take part in any part of the globe unless the United States has some sort of an active role. Mm. That doesn't necessarily mean chief right. role, but an active role. Admiral Keating, when he was uh, PACOM, um, he, he liked to use the term, we have to lead from the rear. Is that sort of what you're talking about? It, it depends. Mr. Obama uses a slightly different uh, term. He calls leading from behind. And there are times when leading from behind is appropriate. For instance, you were in the service, as was I. Uh, as a young platoon leader, you need to lead from the front. Mm -hmm. You need to rally your troops, follow you. Mm -hmm. When you're a division commander, or a corps commander, or an army commander, then it's probably better if you lead from wherever the center of decision making is. It may be behind, it may be concurrent with your frontline troops, but it doesn't necessarily mean you lead from the front. Mm. Mm. Interesting. It's it's a big change up for the for the U.S. Isn't it? I mean during the during the Cold War, <laughs> I was say the Civil War. During the Cold War, we were certainly leading from the front. It seemed. And now it's a different era. It requires a new leadership style. Well, look, by the time Mr. Obama took office, uh, we were mired down in two pretty unpopular wars, and he was going to do his best to get out. And that's what he was elected for, he right. believes, and I do. Actually, I think the majority of the American people have voted for that. But it hasn't worked out real well. Mm -hmm. And our equities aren't necessarily much better now. I thank God that a certain number of more of U.S. servicemen and women won't be killed, won't be maimed. Right. Uh, but uh, there is a question of how much our influence has suffered and uh, therefore how much in the future we might have to be making further down payments. Mm. Mm. Well, you certainly give us something to think about there. Some people say that the U.S. approach to Asia should be based on a concept of the Indo-Pacific region rather than the Asia-Pacific region. In fact, we have a map here. Could we put that map up? Okay, here's our map. Um, can we make that a little bit bigger, maybe? Okay, so um, this is a, pretty much the whole of the Indo-Pacific region. The arguments I've heard what you think about this is, okay, um, our policy towards Asia would be more efficient uh, and perhaps more successful if we looked at the area as the Indo-Pacific region rather than Asia-Pacific and then sort of gave an afterthought to the subcontinent. What, what's your thought about that? I'm pretty bullish on it. Uh, on the Indo-Pacific? On the Indo-Pacific. Uh, I think the, just limiting ourselves to Asia-Pacific. Uh, is not correct, uh, particularly when India uh, has a look east policy and is very interested in Asia. Right, right. Uh, and particularly as Sri Lanka uh, yeah. can loom large in any sort of naval uh, uh, philosophies uh, in, uh, in the Indo-Pacific. So I'm very bullish on it and have been for some time. Well, now, your former Deputy Secretary of State, let me ask you this question. This would require a sort of realignment of the bureaus within the State Department, wouldn't it? If we were to approach our policy in Asia as a Indo with an Indo-Pacific focus rather than an Asia-Pacific focus? It, well, that's an easy thing to do. It's a bureaucratic changing boxes on a, on a, on a line diagram. That wouldn't set up any turf battles or that kind no, of stuff? No, there always turf battles, but this is why you have a secretary and deputy that's supposed to adjudicate these things. But there are other subsets that have to would move concurrently, concurrently, and that would be to make sure that our combatant commander here in the Pacific also uh, straddles the new responsibilities of of, uh, of uh, India and Sri Lanka. And as a matter of fact, for the most part, they do. Uh, but uh, it takes some small changes in doctrine. The bureaucratic problem in the State Department is certainly manageable. Okay. Now, there is a question of span of control. Uh, you have uh, so many countries in, in, uh, in Asia, Southeast Asia, Northeast Asia, and South Pacific, and to add several from the subcontinent may mean that you want to have an undersecretary in charge mm -hmm. and because of span of control, how many countries would be under uh, one assistant secretary's uh, domain. It doesn't seem like it would be that difficult of no. a change. 
Okay, uh, we're going to take a break here. You're watching Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. Our guest today is Ambassador Richard L. Armitage. Uh, he is a former uh, Deputy Secretary of State of the United States, uh, also President of Armitage, Armitage International. We'll be right back. Inspired by an ancient culture, classical Chinese dance, vigorous physicality, timeless stories, 5,000 years of Chinese music and dance, Shen Yun presents authentic Chinese culture. Coming to Blaisdell Concert Hall, May 8th and 9th. Tickets at ShenYun.com or call 808-792-3919. Aloha, my name is Paul Jackson, better known as PJ, and my local interest is in sports. I have my own sports radio show at KWAI AM 1080 that you can stream live. I also have my own website, pjsportsradio.com. We have live guests in studio, and we talk about discussions and topics that everyone wants to know locally here on the islands. We cover everything from surfing to basketball to whatever's going on locally, sports-wise. We try to do our best and cover the topics in depth as much as we can. Once again, thank you for joining PJ here on Hawaii Sports Update. Mahalo. Welcome back to Asia in Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. Our guest today is Ambassador Richard O. Armitage. Uh, our show today is called um, A View of Asia from the Potomac. And obviously, we've been... Um, uh, borrowing on uh, Secretary Armitage's uh, vast experience. He said something kind of interesting there when we were talking about bureaucratic, possible bureaucratic changes the State Department might have to undergo if, if, it, if we took this um, Indo-Pacific focus to our policy rather than one limited to Asia-Pacific. Something like um, the duties of the Deputy Secretary are to, how did you put that, put out brush fires to bring about change? What, 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 is the, what, what does the deputy do? Well, first of all, the deputy does whatever the secretary wants him to do. But in our, <laughs> okay. in, in our uh, division of, of labor with Secretary Powell, uh, he was the, the CEO and I was the COO. Okay. Uh, he traveled a certain amount. I travel less because I had to run the building on a daily basis. Okay. And he was very kind to me. He made it clear from day one that whenever I act on any issue, it had the same imprimatur as if he had signed his name. So this enormously empowered me as deputy, and it also freed the bureaus and the State Department to realize they didn't have to line up at the secretary's door, because after all, he's a busy guy. Right, right, they right. could line up at my door, and right. I would adjudicate their issue on the spot with the same uh, weight as if the secretary of state had done it. Uh, so, and we, I, I did a lot more in Asia than he did. He did a lot in the Middle East and things of that nature because uh, it was where his attention was required. When you look at the bureaus in the State Department, um, I don't know if this is an unfair question, but let's try it anyway. Which are the stronger bureaus, in other terms of like experience and level of personnel and that kind of thing? Well, for years and years, uh, the EAP, or the East Asia Bureau, was the premier bureau. East Asia Bureau. Okay. Uh, and uh, it, it, it shifted a bit uh, under uh, Dr. Rice. It became less, less so. Uh, and uh, the Near East, South Asia Bureau, and the EUR, the European Bureau, came up uh, somewhat. Uh, Central and South America and uh, the, uh, the subcontinent, uh, those bureaus uh, were somewhat newer, had less well-defined career paths. So I wouldn't mm. say they were weaker. They just hadn't had the care and feeding for as long a time as they're necessary to really bring superior officers. But what it takes, it takes a secretary who will empower his, his different uh, line organizations, and it takes the line organization themselves to spend sufficient time on the career development of their own officers. It's extraordinarily important, and it's not so much fun. So today, in today's world, right today, which bureau would you say is the strongest? Is it, is it sort of gravitated away from East Asia? Yeah, I think it has graduated. Uh, it gravitated somewhat. Uh, the Secretary of State is notoriously difficult to pin down in Asia, mm. uh, though the President has been very good about being out here. Uh, I would say that uh, probably the NEA Bureau, the Near East South Asia Bureau, has been premier one. That's where most of the attention is now. 
Okay, um, near and they've got an absolutely terrific assistant secretary by the name of Ann Patterson right now who's really giving, giving that organization some moment. That includes Pakistan, right? Uh, yes, it does. Okay, so Pakistan, Iran. No, Pakistan's in the South Asia, excuse me. South Asia, yeah. okay, so it would be Iran, Iraq. Um, Iran, Iraq, UAE, uh, okay. Israel, okay. Lebanon, Jordan, yada, yada. Yada, yada, okay, okay, good. Um, so how do we, how, how, how should we engage China? You know, this seems to be a question that's always, you know, on people's minds. Are we engaging China the right way? Are we trying to engage China the right way? Or? Well, let's, let's remember that it takes two to tango, and our de being desirous of engaging them in that right way doesn't mean that they're wanting to be engaged in that way. <laughs> so they have a say. They've got a vote right. uh, here. Second of all, uh, I don't think we're necessarily engaging in the right way. We have a, a, a myriad of talks uh, to include the strategic and economic dialogue, and we have umpteen cabinet officers who go there, or they come, you know, do a home and home series with us. Uh, but under the surface of U.S.-China relations, it's actually there's less than meets the eye. Uh, it's somewhat troubled. There's not much progress. In fact, I think you'd be hard pr pressed to really put your finger on a major uh, progress that the U.S. and China have had. I don't see it. Well, you know, I, I think I'm right with you there because um, people say, oh, we need a relationship with China because that'll help us to rein in North Korea. Well, I don't see that happening. Well, we need a relationship with China because that'll help us to rein in Iran. Well, maybe they helped a little bit there. Well, if we have a good relationship with China, we'll be able to work on currency manipulation problems. Oh, I don't see that happening. Um, people say, well, we have mill-to-mill -mill relations, you know, mill-to-mill -mill talks. I, I, I'm having trouble seeing that, where that's going. Well, look, it, in, in my view, it's always better to be talking with our lips than with our hands and our feet. <laughs> that's so, a good way to put uh, it. Yeah. Should we engage China? Absolutely. Why? Because there are 1.3 billion people mm -hmm. whose rise could be the most important event in the first half of the century. Right. So right. that's sufficient reason to try to engage them. Uh, but we can't engage them uh, in a way uh, that puts our equities at risk. And there's a limit to how much China wants to be engaged. I personally believe that President, mm, that's Xi, a good, Jinping, that's a good point. President Xi Jinping really believes in his heart that what the United States wants is a color revolution for China and the end of the Communist Party in China. As far as I know, that is not what anyone wants in the United States. Uh, but uh, that's what I believe he and his colleagues believe. Therefore, it's going to be hard, I think, to engage them meaningfully particularly when they are having uh, economic doldrums right now. Uh, they're using anti-corruption purges uh, to get rid of not only corrupt party officials and local officials, but also apparently to get rid of potential political rivals. So uh, it's very difficult to see how we can engage in a meaningful way China at this time, but we should try. Isn't the U.S.'s ideas, okay, China, we want you to be a part of the international system as it currently exists and take on a, you know, um, a reasonable amount of responsibilities to preserve the system as is. And as you suggest, China just doesn't want to buy into that. Well, uh, look at it from a Chinese point of view. Why should China buy into a system basically devised by the United States? She feels pretty good about herself and wants to have a part of the say in devising right. the new system. Uh, I get that. Okay. Uh, I, I see where, where they're coming from. Now, it would be so disruptive, however, to the system that has been established since uh, in the post-war, Second World War time period, uh, that it may be a pipe dream of China, uh, and that other nations won't particularly buy it. But China right now sees the United States as an eagle, which is not flying quite so high. Mm -hmm. no, that's a good way to put And it. I think they want to take advantage of it. And I myself would say, you, know, I, you were kind enough to mention uh, that I was from Washington. Well, that's not always a good thing. Um, <laughs> because when Chinese or other friends around the world look at Washington and see a Congress which can't move, mm -hmm. sees a country which seems to have lost temporarily some of its efficiency and energy, they see a model which might be right for the plucking. Now, we're coming out of our economic doldrums. We're coming out of this. 
if you travel around our nation and you see local uh, and state leaders who are actually doing things, unlike the U.S. Congress, uh, they're trying to make a difference. And it, again, fills me with hope and enthusiasm that Eagle will fly again. Oh, uh, that's good. I, I'm right with you. I'm right with you there. Um, yeah, it's pretty hard to sell the U.S. model of government when you see such gridlock in the Congress. Yeah, as I say, we seem to have lost our competitive edge, our efficiency, and our energy. Uh, but that'll change, too, when you and I and others get off our duff and vote these guys out, every one of them. Good. That's Make why I them do the job. To vote. Make got them to vote. do the job that we think they ought to do. Right. Oh, that's good. I, I, I agree with you completely. Um, We talked a little bit about the. Uh, I think this is this is a follows on to what we're talking about here. We talked a little bit on the car on the way over about the Asia Infrastructure and Investment Bank, mm -hmm. and the U.S. Well, official Washington seems to be very upset about this. And, well, but yeah. you have a different view. Well, the the Chinese in the main have decided that they'd like to start an uh, Asian uh, Infrastructure Investment Bank, and underline the word bank, uh, and. Uh, there's some problems in getting it started uh, because it's going to depend on a certain amount of transparency and uh, adherence to rules, et cetera. Uh, we're in sort of a rules-based banking system. Mm -hmm. I happen to think it's a good thing, and many of our friends in the area, to include Australians and South Koreans and others, are looking at it. Uh, uh, Great Britain has decided uh, to join something that we criticize uh, the British for, uh, I think wrongly, because the fact of the matter is we don't have a policy yet. So in the lack of a policy, how can we blame anybody else for making their own decisions? In a lack of clear direction from Washington, a clear understanding of where we're going to go. God knows the infrastructure needs in Asia are large enough to have another institution. Mm. And if it is one that gives the World Bank or the IMF a run for its money in terms of efficiency, uh, time to put ordinance on target, uh, then that's a good thing. <laughs> oh, that's, that, that, that's interesting. Yeah, actually, the more infrastructure there is in, in Asia, the more uh, business opportunities there could be for everybody. I mean, isn't that why the British are in it? It's not right. just business yeah. opportunities. How hard is it? Yeah. <laughs> it's not like, well, we're not abandoning America. We're going for business opportunities. We ought to be part of it, in my view. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, interesting. Um, salami slicing. Mm hmm we talked a little bit about that beforehand too of course this seems to be a big topic on a lot of people's minds how do you deal with chinese salami slicing this 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 way about going things like well we'll we'll, we'll make a little action here and kind of look around and see if everybody's looking or what the action is if the coast is clear we'll, we'll go a little further look around and then go a little further if there's no blowback how do you deal with that well, the, this salami tactic that you refer to is also called gray zone activity, and that, that is activity below that which would call for a military response. Okay. Uh, you'd say that uh, the uh, activities uh, of the air defense intercept zone, which was unilaterally announced by the Chinese, uh, which called for an immediate response by the United States. We flew two B-52s right through it. And, Japanese through a couple of fighter suits to let the Chinese know they can say whatever they want. We're not buying it. Mm. Uh, I think every action of China, small or not so small, has to be responded to. Mm. For instance, there was a, um, an operation, excuse me, an exercise just completed mm -hmm. in uh, Camp Pendleton, California. Okay. Uh, the ground self-defense forces of Japan and U.S. Marines, about 470 or so Marines, about 270 ground self-defense forces. They stormed ashore in the beaches of Pendleton in a live fire exercise. What was the stated purpose of this live fire exercise or exercise Iron Fist? It was to retake islands. Some cockle. Retake islands. Mm. So action by China, reaction by the United States and Japan. Uh, look at uh, Mr. Abbott in, in Australia during uh, the visit of Prime Minister Abe several months ago. And he announced that uh, Japan, uh, Australia most probably was going to purchase a submarine a year for the next six years. Uh, some uh, analysts have referred to submarines as the new bling of Asia. Uh, and um, everyone wants one or two or three. 
<laughs> and this has all been brought forward by China. No one wants to have to spend that amount of money in the defense budget. But it's China's activities that are bringing forth these actions. Mm. You're watching Asia in Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. Um, our guest today is Ambassador Richard L. Armitage, uh, President of Armitage International. Uh, he's giving us uh, his view on Asian affairs. I call this the view of Asia from the Potomac. And we'll be right back. Hi, I'm Jay Fidel. That's Ted Ralston. You know, Ted is the uh, host of Where the Road Leads. It shows uh, every Friday from 4 to 5 p.m. It's about technology. It's about how people collaborating and solve problems with modern technology. It's where the road leads. We all know that. We should all be listening. Join us there, 4 to 5 p.m. every Friday. Now, what about that do you agree with? All of it. I knew he'd say that. Aloha. Say aloha. Aloha. Good. Hi, aloha. My name is Chris Leatham, and I have host a show called The Economy and You. Uh, the show plays every Wednesday at noon. And on my show, I bring on guests who are interested or working in the technology space. And uh, so I'd like you to come and watch the show and learn with me about all the sort of exciting things that we're doing in Hawaii to build and grow our economy ecosystem. So I'd like to say aloha, and I look forward to seeing you on the show. Thank you. Welcome back to Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. Our guest today is Ambassador Richard L. Armitage, uh, President of Armitage uh, International, also former Deputy U.S. Secretary of State. We've been talking about a host of uh, Asian uh, issues, contemporary Asian issues. Um, you know, it wasn't that long ago, China was poor, backward, technologically way out of date. And it began to you know, borrow a lot of money from European banks, Japanese banks, American banks, uh, borrow or otherwise acquire technology. Um, became the sort of the manufacturing hub of the world in many people's view. Um, have we built a giant that we don't know quite how to deal with? First of all, I think we need to take a deep breath, and not engage in hyperbole when we look at China. China is 1.3 billion, it's the second largest economy in the world. If we'd have been having this discussion say, uh, five years ago, mm -hmm. seven years ago, mm -hmm. we'd have been talking about what is the date when the Chinese economy overtakes the United States mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. the number one in the world. Nobody talks like that anymore because it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, You uh, don't think the, US, the Chinese economy will surpass that in the U.S.? In other words? No. Okay. I don't. Uh, second, and I, I look at China now, well, let me make another point first. Our president, President Obama, received a Nobel Prize for being anybody but Bush. A person who okay. really should receive a Nobel Prize is Deng Xiaoping, who raised 600 million people out of poverty. Mm. We didn't do it. He did it. Mm. Uh, and I think all credit uh, should be given to that. So now we have a China uh, which uh, for a while was depending on, uh, on uh, industrial uh, exports. Uh, kind of the uh, Japanese model, which sure. is shown to be failing. Sure. <clears throat> so you've got a China which is trying to develop internal consumptions now, but it's also a China which has had her, because of her borrowing, her debt to GDP re ratio go to 248% of GDP as her debt. That's uh, out of step with every, any emerging country in the world. A lot of people <coughs> don't realize that about China, do they? They, they think, oh, China is so wealthy, China's got vast foreign reserves. They don't realize these other things. And she's also got vast energy needs. She's also got vast water needs. She's also got vast environmental needs. So I think a look at China has to be a look at the whole country. When I look at China, and I, I don't want a grumpy, fractured China. I want to only want a China that pays by the same rules all the rest of us do. But when I look at China, I see, believe it or not, a lack of confidence. I mean, what kind of country keeps a Nobel laureate prize winner in jail? Or what kind of country spends so much of their money on the people's armed police? Or what, what, kind of, uh, what kind of country has anyone with means trying to immigrate? Good points. That's a, company, a country lacking in a certain amount of confidence. 
No, I, I agree with you. I agree with you. Well, on one hand, Chinese can look cocky beneath all of that. I think there is a, some insecurity. Well, to some extent, one can understand a certain amount of cockiness. They've done a lot. I mean, right. there are a, a, a lot of people, but they've got a whole bunch more to do. And uh, the, so, to in some extent, uh, China is like a train and a car racing across a trestle. We don't know if they're going to make it. <laughs> Let's move on to Japan, because I know um, just about every year, you and Dr. Nye collectively write a report about Japan, the uh, U.S.-Japanese alliance. Um, what's your take on Mr. Abe? What's your take on collective self-defense? Well, I, the cabinet decision on collective, the right of collective self-defense is a real step in the right direction for alliance capability. Joe and, Joe Nye, Dr. Nye and I have long uh, written and held that uh, the prohibition on collective self-defense was an inhibitor mm -hmm. to alliance uh, cooperation. On Mr. Abe himself, uh, if you can find another democratically elected leader in the world's 160 or so democracies that has accomplished as much in the first two years as Mr. Abe has, then I'll hold your head. Um, he's, he's done a, a heck of a lot. And what has been most notable is his diplomacy, except in China and Korea, as we yeah. understand. But in Southeast Asia, in South Asia, even in Europe, Turkey, he's been pretty magnificent. So he's really been indefatigable. He's put some drive into the people of Japan, and thus far, uh, for a Japanese prime minister, still enjoys rather formidable ratings of around 50 percent, positive ratings. Actually, he's he's done what the United States has wanted Japan to do for quite some time, but other prime ministers didn't have the political pop punch to pull it off. Yeah, a lot of the things, National S Secrets Act, uh, National Security Council, right of collective self-defense, uh, relaxation of the principles of, uh, or the export principles on defense technology. These are things that put more money in the defense budget right. Uh, right. after 10 straight years of decline. Uh, right. And uh, so, yeah, he's, uh, he's the real deal. Right, right. Let's talk a little bit about Korea. Mm -hmm. um, a hypothetical question. Eh, eh, we don't answer <laughs> hypothetical. You don't, you don't like this? Okay. No. Um, Okay, how can I rephrase it and make it <laughs> unhypothetical? Okay. Uh, gosh, I don't know how I can do that. Do it. You want to try it? Okay, Korea is reunited under Seoul. Yeah. What, what kind of change in intra-Asian relations might that create? Well, I, can't, I think it depends. Uh, it, a united peninsula of Korea under Seoul leadership. Uh, and I think what you're asking is how others would react, how Japan would react, how China would react. How, or, uh, how would Korea's own behavior be affected? Well, first of all, I, there are, you'd have to lay some conditions out for me. For instance, if U.S. forces were still on the peninsula of Korea, okay. then I think neighbors would look a little differently. Japan would not be worried about a united uh, Korea. Uh, China may have some worries, but not overwhelming. Uh, I think we'd be very cautious in where we moved our troops, and at any rate, it would take the uh, the uh, accomplish accomplishment uh, the the accomplice of the of the South Korean government. If, on the other hand, uh, the United Peninsula of Korea is seen simply as a land bridge into China, that would not be seen real well in the U.S. or Japan. If, on the other hand, Peninsula of Korea is seen as a bridge into Asia and into the Pacific, this would be well met. Mm. I think by everyone. So I don't think we can answer the question without knowing some of the conditions, U.S. forces, yes or no, uh, and what's the direction of uh, how do the Koreans themselves see their, their activities. Right. Hmm. Hmm. I'll have to think about that one. Um, sometimes I have to admit, Korea confuses me a little bit. Uh, on one hand, it's, you know, sort of very concerned about the U.S. leaving, right? Um, sometimes I think it feels like the United States unjustifiably gives more attention to Japan than it gives to Korea. Um, and then when the United States says uh, things like, uh, well, we want to give you back command of your troops in wartime situations. Uh, you, you guys are a mature military now. And then the Koreans, oh, no, 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 we're not ready for that, you know. How long has it been? Um, the younger Koreans seem to think, well, 
America, you're too overpowering of a partner. We want more space, you know, um, more ability to create our own identity, uh, not in your shadow. And then it seems sometimes that Korea wants to move towards China and kind of be equidistant between the U.S. and China. So I, I'm a little confused about Korea at times. Help me I mean, out. Well, Mr. Sharp, I'm not sure I can help you out. I think a certain amount of confusion is warranted. But first of all, historically, the U.S. relationship with Korea has been a pretty troubled one. Uh, uh, and uh, you can go way back in history, or you just have to go back to the to the the uh, Treaty of Portsmouth and the activities of the United States right afterward, where we acquiesced in Japan's colonization of Korea in uh, return for Japan acquisition and our colonization of the Philippines and Hawaii. Mm. It's called the Taft Katsura Memorandum. So, okay. for educated Koreans, they realize, and, and believe me, they're all educated. Sure. And yeah. through the Wilsonian era, where uh, Koreans actually thought Wilsonian democracy applied to them, too. Fast forward all the way through uh, the, the Truman uh, Atchison comments about uh, Korea being outside our defense perimeter and the North Koreans' attack. So, from a Korean point of view, the U.S. relationship has been somewhat troubled historically, and we have generally come down on the side of Japan mm -hmm. because it was in our interest. Mm -hmm. I, I can't change the facts. It, so they, there, there is a certain amount of, of ambivalence. It, it, um, it, it seems to me the truth of the matter is, um, I, 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 as harsh as it might sound, is Japan's a more significant country. Well, we would not say that if, because when we said that before, uh, that was the a North Koreans, the North State Koreans, my behalf, probably. Uh, and each is significant in their own way, I think, is the, is the correct answer. But you raised another issue, whether Korea is moving towards China. Well, economically, China is the most important trading partner. That's the right, fact. Right. Uh, economically, uh, tourists from China are the leading source of, tour, of tourists for the Republic of Korea. It's a fact. Right. Mrs. Park, President of Korea, has met with Xi Jinping four or five times. That's a fact. Right. Uh, what I do not think is that she's moving her country into a Chinese orbit. I think she's trying to get from China the utmost cooperation for her problem in the North called Kim Jong Moon. Mm -hmm. Now, whether she'll be successful and how much influence China really has, I think is an open question. Much less than people think, I believe. Mm. Oh, that's good to hear. That's good to hear. Um, you seem to think that the U.S. is ready for Tsai Ing-wen if she should become president. Uh, uh, Dr. Tsai Ing-wen is the DPP uh, most probable candidate for president in the election in 14 months or so. Uh, the last time the DPP was in office, uh, they were quite troublesome because Mr. Uh, president Chen Sui bin was very unpredictable for the United States and, by the way, for the People's Republic of China and, by the way, for his own colleagues in Taiwan. Okay. Um, I've got a feeling that... We're coming down to our last minute here. Pardon me? We're coming down to our last minute. Okay. Tsai Ing-wen will come to Washington soon. I'm sure she will give a major address in which she will uh, try to calm any fears Washington might have about a, a, a second DPP tour mm. term. Mm. 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 Thank you very much for watching Asia in Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. Uh, our guest today has been Ambassador Richard L. Armitage. Our show today, A View of Asia from the Potomac. And we are extremely happy to have had Ambassador Armitage here with us. He will be the keynote speaker at the Pacific Forum uh, 40th anniversary dinner tomorrow night. If you still haven't gotten a ticket, I'm sure the Pacific Forum will be glad to help you out. Their number is 521-6745. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you again next week.